Welcome. We will get started in about 30 seconds as our colleagues are joining us. We have a fabulous panel for you this afternoon. Okay, welcome, welcome the sector, um, whether or not you work in immigration settlement and integration or you're working in women's services, welcome to this important panel conversation. My name is Debbie Douglas. I work for OCASI, the Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants. We are the umbrella organizations for agencies working with migrants, immigrants, and refugees across Ontario. We take up lots of space on the national level because we know immigration um, is, tends to be a national issue um, in terms of policy while people settle locally. I am thrilled to be joining you and to be welcoming you working in partnership with our sisters at Canadian Women's Foundation. I am joining you today from Toronto. Um, Toronto is a traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. This place now called Toronto is home to many diverse nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. It is 13, Treaty 13 territory and is also subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. I want to acknowledge that we are all treaty peoples and to affirm Okasi's commitment to honoring the treaties. This year, for the first time, we mark the first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. But every day, we will mourn the thousands of children stolen from, the, from their peoples, from their nations. The children who died in residential schools from abuse, cruelty, and neglect. We call, especially in this time of year, as we remember abuse against women, we call for the full implementation of the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the 231 calls to justice of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, and to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the full implementation of UN DRIP. OCASI stands in solidarity with Indigenous peoples across Canada, and we will continue to use our platforms to amplify their calls for justice and sovereignty. As I said, we have a fabulous, fabulous panel waiting for you. Um, we have three actually reasons, I would say, for why it is that we're holding the panel today. As you know, Canada has been, has committed to resettling 40,000 Afghan refugees and others over the next two or so years. We are troubled by the slow movement, but we are committed to ensuring that those who arrive have access to all of the supports that they need. So this afternoon's panel is geared towards those who are providing direct services, who may see new clients, and I would say will see new clients over the next few months, whether those clients are refugees, immigrants, or refugee claimants. Whether working at women's, at women's organizations or in community service roles, it is important for those of us providing services to know who our clients are, what kinds of supports do they need and how best we should be able to serve them. And I think it's important as service providers for us to also think about how we center the rights, the privacy, how we do we recognize the agency that individuals and individual women bring when they show up in our office space or increasingly during our online service provisions. We will encourage you to honor their lived experiences and to listen to what the women who show up to you for support are saying to you in terms of what their immediate and going forward needs are. So it is now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for this afternoon, Anu. 
Anu um, will take it from here. Anu Dugal from the Canadian Women's Foundation. Thank you, Anu. Hi, Debbie. Thank you so much, Debbie. Thank you for that very thoughtful and important introduction to um, what, and reminder that we are all treaty people and how we can uh, work together to ensure that we respect those treaties in our space. I'm coming to you from um, uh, Montreal, Chochake, which is traditional territories of the Ganya Gahaga, but like many places, is also a meeting place and a, um, a gathering place for many nations, including the Haudenosaunee and um, uh, Anishinaabe and um, uh, other the 10 nations in Quebec that I also um, am in relationship with. So um, I am very happy. I will move right along to introduce our panelists. As Debbie said, they have amazing things to share with you and I don't want to keep them waiting. So. First of all, I'd like to introduce Adina Niazi from Afghan Women's Organization, Beba Sfigir from Calgary Women's Association, Calgary Immigrant Women's Association, Mercy Loluvi from the Immigrant Women's Services of Ottawa, and Khalida Naziri from the Afghan Youth Engagement and Development Initiative. So they are going to be speaking this, uh, this afternoon on um, several things. I'm going to start off with a general question. And the order that will go in for this first question is first Adina, then Beba, then Mercy, then Khalida. So the first question is, uh, please tell us about the women who are coming to Canada under the federal government's current resettlement plan. Who are they and how have they come to be part of this program? So over to you, Adina. You're still on mute, just to ask you to take yourself off mute. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, thank you, Anu. Uh, uh, yes, I'm from the Afghan woman uh, organization for Refugee and Immigrant Services. And uh, I thank uh, the Canadian Women Foundation and Kukwazi for the opportunity to be here today. And also as an Afghan refugee myself, and as someone who is in constant contact with the Afghans inside Afghanistan, uh, I, I feel very grateful uh, to and I, I pass my gratitude to my fellow advocates and the, for the people of Canada for offering their compassionate, moral, and material support to the Afghans who have arrived there and who they are not their ways to come. As I mentioned, we are in close contact with the Afghans. We have some programs inside Afghanistan, including an orphanage. And also we are a sponsorship holder under which we are uh, bringing refugees actually from across the world and also some Afghan refugees under the private sponsorship of refugees. So many Canadians are asking, they want to know who are the Afghans who are coming here and why they are coming here? I think the simple response to this question would be because they are, they are forced to become refugees and they are running for their lives, seeking safety as refugees under the Canadian Compassionate Humanitarian Program. And the Canadian has uh, uh, committed to sponsorship and bringing refugees in the international community. Canada is known for its compassion in this area. So uh, the, 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 the women who are coming and the refugees who are coming here, they are not coming by choice. They don't come here to advance their economic lives, they are simple, simply coming here just to survive. Believe me, nobody wants to become a refugee, but it's possible. I remember when 35 years back I became a refugee, it was a hard feeling. So the most Afghan refugees who are coming here, they are the victims of historical context that I will briefly explain how they got to this stage. There has been ongoing conflict in Afghanistan for over 40 years. And as it started actually in 1975, when the coup, which was organized by the Soviet police, uh, of the former Soviet Union, took place. And then 
the Afghanistan, Afghanistan was occupied by the former Soviet Union. I'll tell you that prior to 1975, the people of Afghanistan, they left in peace for 45 years and Afghanistan was one of the most peaceful and secure countries in the world. Women's right was guaranteed in Afghan constitution of back in 1963. At that time, women were holding positions in the country cabinet, parliament, and there were women professionals, doctors, lawyers, judges, professors. Before 1978, I remember I used to teach at Kabul University. I was a very young woman at that time. I used to stand in front of class full of boys who were ET boys in the class as a young woman with the same dress code. I never felt obstacle. Later, I felt actually respected for being a woman. But the ruthless Soviet occupation and then the fighting of the freedom fighters for their liberation and the involvement of US and Western countries in assisting groups to fight the Soviet Union, which turned Afghanistan a battlefield between the two superpowers. And then after the Soviet Union, the warlords who occupied the parts of Afghanistan, they start civil war erupted. All these conditions, they assisted Taliban to get power. So the Taliban could consolidate their, for their power and sources and they got power in 1996. They entered Afghanistan back in 1996. Like uh, talking about Taliban, uh, their brutal attack of women and forcing women into the dark, darkest period of ignorance and the punishment of any voice of opposition are a few atrocities that could be a common code of contact for this group. But during the 90s, persecution of viol and violation of women's rights had reached to an extreme. The schools were closed. Women stopped, even the videos, women, the video who were the single breadwinner for their families. <laughs> they, they were not allowed to go work outside. Women could not walk out of their home without a companion. Some of the women they didn't have a male companion. At that time, because the schools were closed, we stepped up in Afghanistan. We opened some <coughs> home base, sorry, home based schools for Afghan kids who were deprived from the education. So I was going in back and forth regularly to Afghanistan. That's why I have the first hand experience what it means to live under the Taliban. And, but at that time also, I was really motivated by the Afghan women's resilience and for their love for education uh, at that time. Women was risking, they were was risking their lives to open home beat underground schools in all parts of Afghanistan. Our schools were in Kabul and the girls who were coming to our schools, they were also risking their lives because if they were caught, they would have been punished badly by the Taliban. But after the tragedy of September 11, when the the U.S. started bombing Afghanistan uh, just against the Taliban. Then uh, uh, things changed. So, but actually, U.S. that time they justified the bombing of the people of uh, Afghan people uh, to uh, liberate actually Afghan women from Taliban. So the Taliban were defeated. NATO forces got power, they came to Afghanistan, and when the democ democracy was introduced, we had a president. With these changes, despite the continued insecurity, continued insecurity and concerns, and also despite the lack of unity, there were very positive changes, particularly in the lives of the women. The international community assisted to rebuild Afghanistan, and also many Afghan professionals and educated um, diasporas, they went back to help in rebuilding their country. So the country started to revitalize re re in a very few years and women had big gains. Schools reopened, many women 
were leading the civic society, the exit in all fields of life, including sport, robotic, science, music, uh, and women had 27% of uh, seats in the parliament. So there was a gleam of hope for Afghans and for women. But with the decisions of the US in the past August and its ally, to leave Afghanistan in such a rush without any strategies in a, with such uncertainty. So uh, this, the people of Afghanistan were left, especially the women, they were left in a stage of agony, fighting fear for their lives. And you just put women back in the hand of the same Taliban, brutal Taliban. So this is how the Taliban came back to Afghanistan, but this time they are stronger. And we are back in the place we were in 2001. So according, now, according to UNICEF, Afghanistan, Afghanistan are the second largest refugee population in the world. And Afghanistan faces the largest humanitarian crisis in the modern life. Mm -hmm. Taliban return stronger, and mm -hmm. women and girls are deprived, deprived of their most basic human rights here. Uh, so there are senseless killing, targeted killing actually. Um, there are also records of uh, public beatings. Many women have been killed and their bodies are found in pain. That's how women are living for their lives and they're coming and becoming refugees. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Adina. Thank you for that um, historical overview of a, a very considerable period of time. And I appreciate that it's a very short time in which to cover so much um, information. Um, but I think, it, as you said, it's important that we we have that background as we go into this conversation. So many, many thanks for providing that um, as, uh, as succinctly as you did. So um, I'll pass it over to you, Beba. Thank you. And just, sorry, I will remind people just as you're turning your mic on, Beba, I'll just remind people to put uh, questions they might have in the Q&A box uh, for the end of the session. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. A pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction, Debbie and uh, Anaroga. And Adina did a beautiful, uh, of the two questions that Anaroga asked, um, who is coming and why they are coming. I feel that Adina gave us all such a beautiful answer as to why immigrant, uh, Afghani refugees are coming and in particular why Afghani women are coming. So to all of us who might not have been born uh, in Afghanistan, it gives the, a beautiful context of the gender specific challenges that the refugees that have already come to Canada are facing and will be over the next few years. Just to add to what Debbie has said in terms of the context of the settlement sector and where we are, um, I just want to say a few words about the um, uh, most recent plans and where the RAP services are in Canada. Most of you who are on the call I can see are associated with the um, resettlement and settlement services. So I'll just be brief in terms of um, where the source of information for us comes based on who has already come and what the plans are. So we, we know that for this fiscal year, uh, a total of 6,000 um, refugees from Afghanistan um, will arrive to Canada by the end of December and another four to 5,000 by the end of the fiscal year, March 2022, which translates to about 1,000 refugees a month. Obviously, the government is still making decisions about the ratio of the privately sponsored and government sponsored refugees. And that fact um, influences and um, creates certain direction for all of us who are in this sector. Um, Afghani refugees will be going to 34 resettlement communities in Canada. And this number will increase in the next while. We in Alberta are expecting a um, flight on December 14th that will bring refugees that are destined to Alberta and uh, BC. And of course, historically and statistically, 
they know that over 50% of all immigrants that come to Canada and refugees for that matter are women. For the purpose of this webinar, I was asked to give a little bit of an Alberta point of view in terms of where the services are. So I have connected with our, you all know that the actual national hub for the resettlement process is agency from uh, Calgary, our colleagues from the Calgary Catholic Immigration Society. And um, of all the refugees that came so far, 300 came to Alberta and uh, those that um, arrived are being served in Edmonton, Calgary and Red Deer. The work of resettlement and communication on the resettlement and just to, to resettlement is the, <clears throat> sorry, the first basic needs uh, services that are provided by RAP agencies. So majority of those people are still in the resettlement uh, a process and um, all the other agencies in Alberta are supporting uh, rep providers like Calgary Catholic Immigration Society and a few other providers in Alberta to do their work and then to refer clients um, in an equitable way to services that can expedite their, their further settlement and integration. So um, the umbrella agency, ACE Alberta Association of Immigrant Serving Agencies um, is working on the communication, putting us all together. And of the 50 plus members of ASA, <clears throat> 20 are strictly settlement agencies with the primary mandate to serve newcomers. And then of them, at least five agencies in Alberta could be considered women serving organization. So who did we see? Who has come and what is the profile of uh, refugees, but also um, to appoint um, immigrant women that have come uh, in this group of 300 people. We have connected with our colleagues at CCIS and got some kind of, a, of an overview of, of what is the composition of the current um, 300 people that we have. So the first point that shared with us is, Jen, and we haven't seen too many of them, you can appreciate that the resettlement process is quite slow because of the COVID, of the isolation, and the fact that there are only two airports right now receiving. And of course, you know that there is a, uh, there is a, a huge number of refugees that will be uh, arriving to Canada from the safe havens in USA and third um, um, countries. So the whole process is still still really in 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 the in the stage of organizing much more so than uh, being part, part of the settlement services, still resettlement, right? So generally speaking, there is one male in the family who is well-educated speaking Pashto, Urdu and Dari, and often, often, very often English. Families are coming with huge disparities be between spouses and dependents. Some women speak Pashto and very little Dari, but can't read or write, write in their language. Some though, have been working outside of their homes with very respectful jobs. We have some human rights advocates that have ar arrived in, in Calgary and uh, we will be connecting with them. Families that have arrived to Alberta are fairly young, between 30 and 40 years of age. Very few seniors, 50% of the population that arrived to Alberta are children between ages five and 12. Most of the children speak only Pashto. Generally, it's a healthy group. Uh, we have uh, seen a few pregnant women and the first baby was born here in Calgary a couple of weeks ago. Most families are Pashto, so quite conservative. And the women that we have seen are quite vocal about their needs and seem to be the drivers in decision in the families. Pay attention to that. To um, Adina's point, well-educated, some of them quite um, emancipated through the education that they have received and ready and willing to engage and to work with us. 
Eba, I'm I'm afraid I do have to stop you there. That's uh, that's a little bit more than five minutes in okay. the first section. You'll I'm sure in the other questions you'll have a chance to come back to some of the points you haven't been able to touch on so no far. No problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And with that, uh, Mercy, I will pass it over to you. And um, just as a as a reminder, we are talking about who are the women who are coming here and how have they come to be a part of the resettlement programs. Thanks, Mercy, over to you. And um, just put yourself on mute if you're not speaking, thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Anu. I am indeed delighted to be part of this important discussion, which is really timely as we welcome the Afghan refugees to Canada. And as we look closely at the women who are joining us in our communities and as we discuss their service needs. Um, I'd like to thank Adina and Beba. Adina giving such an enlightening context uh, about why the women have come and Beba telling us about what has been happening in Alberta. Uh, I'd like to now take us to Ontario and specifically Ottawa to find out what's going on there. Why are these women, who are we seeing? So, so far over 3,000 Afghan government assisted refugees have been welcomed to Ontario. The majority of those arriving want to remain in the GTA where they have relatives and friends. And so far the government has been quite flexible in that regard. There is also the aspect of secondary migration that's going on where those who are sent to other areas in the province of Ontario move back to the GTA causing quite a bit of overload for the RAP agencies in that region. Of the arrivals, similar to what Beba said, about 50% are women and children. The first arrivals are mainly educated and fluent in English, doctors, engineers, women leaders, you, those who had worked with the Canadian government in one capacity or the other in Afghanistan. And although many of them speak fluent English, I must mention and agree with um, Beba that uh, they came with their families and some of their spouses and children may not necessarily have good language skills or literacy. Um, they are housed in hotels where RAP agencies provide them with much needed immediate supports to meet their basic needs and also assistance in completing their immigration documents. As they came so hurriedly, it was difficult for many of them to have complete immigration documents. And this, once that's done, this allows them to apply for other um, health, like, like health cards and child benefits and so on. They are also supported to move into permanent housing within the communities. Um, and some agencies have been working, going to the hotels to provide services such as language assessment. Last week, uh, December 3rd, a chartered flight carrying 243 privately sponsored Afghan refugees landed in Toronto, at the Toronto Pearson International Airport. That's the first batch of privately sponsored refugees. Uh, and they will be meeting their sponsors in other parts of the province. Now, coming specific to Ottawa, as of December 5th, uh, 375 Afghan government assisted refugees were welcomed by the Catholic Center of Immigrants, uh, which is the RAP agency in Ottawa. And the new arrivals have been housed in five hotels where their average stay is five to six weeks. Of this number, 373 Afghan uh, government assisted refugees, 193 are women and children. That's a little over 50%. This number is made up mainly of the youth, young girls, the youth 17 and under. Uh, the bulk are adult women uh, aged 18 to 59 years and most of them are homemakers and a few senior women aged 60 to 70. Their level of English ranges from very low to fluent, though the majority are signing up to attend language classes. Many of them have education, uh, educational level of grade eight or lower. And the women are very eager to learn and seem interested in the shorter training programs as this allows them to, to tend to their family. 
there are a lot of young moms in those who have arrived in Ottawa with young children, and this is indicating an obvious need for childcare. And many of the women, as I mentioned, here in Ottawa, consider themselves as homemakers. So to date, moving right along, 55% of them have moved to permanent housing and more arrivals are expected in Ottawa, although again, there is uncertainty as to how many will remain in the region uh, as they are moving to uh, friends and families elsewhere. Uh, volunteers have also been mobilized in Ottawa to support with matching, mentoring, social and conversation circles, and providing logistical support such as the delivery of furniture to the new homes, pickup of donated goods, etc. And at Immigrant Women's Services uh, Ottawa, we, the newly arrived Afghan women have started knocking on our doors in order to receive women-specific services in a safe environment where they can attend appointments without their spouse or partner, connect with other women, and also receive supports for gender-based violence, mental health, and other issues. Thank Very you, briefly, Nancy. are we done? I, I, do I, I have time for just one? One more sentence, and then okay. I'll pass it over. <laughs> okay, so the big, the big challenge has been housing, um, which is um, their large families. And I just wanted to also say that OCASI, as an umbrella organization, has been doing a lot of work in coordination and advocacy to increase the collective capacity of the sector and uh, equitable outcomes for the Afghan refugees arriving in the province. So I'll leave it there. I have a bit more to say, but I'll leave it there. Thank you, Mercy. We will we'll definitely come around to it in future questions, I'm sure. Right. Um, and I'll pass it over to Khalida to tell us more about the young Afghans who are arriving and maybe what this displacement has looked like from their perspective. Yeah, thank you, Anuradha. And thanks for getting the kh in my name. I know sometimes it's hard. It's Khalida, actually, but I often go by Khalida just because it's easier. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm here to speak. I've been asked to speak more about the youth perspective and the young Afghan perspective. And it's important because when we talk about women, we have to talk about youth and children and families because as Mercy correctly pointed out, in Afghan culture, women are often traditionally considered the homemakers and they're the ones who raise the children. So with regards to youth, you know, what we do know is that most youth have arrived with their families, which is obviously a good thing. We've heard of some isolated cases of children and youth being separated from their parents, either in Afghanistan or in transit somewhere. There was one case that was publicized, right, in Canada where a three-year-old child was separated, um, I think from his mom and siblings at Kabul airport, and then he was evacuated to Qatar at an orphanage and was reunited finally with his family in Canada two weeks later, thankfully. Um, we don't know how many more of these kind of situations exist, but if they do, we hope that the government is prioritizing their reunification. Um, in terms of the Afghan youth who are arriving, you know, the question is like, who are they? Well, it's often said that, you know, the younger generation of Afghanistan is very optimistic. You know, you have to remember Afghanistan has one of the youngest and fastest growing populations in the world. Um, about 63% of their population is 25 years old or younger. That's like 28 almost million Afghans. Um, and by the way, Afghanistan and Canada have similar populations. We both have about 38 million people, but in Canada, our largest age group is between 25 to 44. Um, this younger generation, they're more educated, they're more open-minded, in many ways more liberal, like liberal for like the Afghan context. Uh, they use social media, they follow fashion trends, you know, they're, they're just like you and I, they follow current events. Um, and they have problems, you know, they, they live in a constant state of war. And the difference with this generation, I think about my parents who escaped Afghanistan as refugees almost 30 years ago, the similar situation is this younger generation was born in war and all they have known is war because they were born in the 1990s, right? And so when we're talking about context, right, you have to think about this. When your entire life you've lived in a country that is war-torn, think about what that does to your psyche, right? And what is your definition of home and, and what do you know about home? And now you have to leave that home, right? And um, it's, it's displacement. So now we're talking about displacement, which, you know, it, it 
causes disconnection. It weakens social fabrics. And we know at that youth age, it's that's something that's really important to have. And so displacement makes youth and young people feel fear, they feel distrust, they feel instability, and these are valid emotions considering what they're going through. And so that, that is, I would say, like the context of, of young Afghans that we should know about. We should not pity or view the young Afghan youth as bleak. You know, they are bright, they're optimistic. They recognize this opportunity to change kind of the trajectory of their life. Uh, they don't have, you know, the tools and resources they need right now. And that's why they need all of us and all of you and an entire village, they say, the village's support to kind of get, get through this. So that's the context, I'll leave it there. Uh, for the sake of time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Halida. So now we're going to pass over to the next round of questions. And this time I'm going to start with Mercy and then to Adina, um, then to Halida, and then to Beba. So with Mercy, the next question is really about what are the service needs? Um, so what are the needs of the people you're seeing who are arriving already? And what do you anticipate seeing more of as more people arrive? So um, Mercy, I'll pass that over to you. So thank you, Anu. I just want to make a, a quick uh, note about, you know, the difference between the women that are coming in terms of their status in terms of arriving as government assisted refugees and also privately sponsored refugees and to note that <clears throat> they both have common basic needs such as the need for shelter the need for food clothing transportation etc the difference being that the government uh, provides a modest financial support uh, and relies on grassroots uh, settlement organizations to facilitate settlement and privately sponsored refugees have uh, their sponsors providing the support. Um, and so, you know, the, the there's a lot of emotional support that privately sponsored refugees receive. And um, we find at our agency that assisted, uh, gov government assisted refugees present more complex needs. Uh, many of the of many of these needs brought on by their pre-migration circumstances. We've heard quite a bit of from what Adina has said and what Kalida has also said. Traditionally, the, the guards tend to settle in smaller cities and have few lower education um, and limited official language skills. Um, and it's particularly important to look at their pre-migration uh, circumstances. This is particularly important because of the impact that these experiences have on these women, some of whom were subjected to horrific abuse such as rape and torture, as Adina alluded to earlier. So on arrival in Canada, these women have quite complex needs, including mental health issues, the stress of being uprooted from their home uh, issues of isolation, lack of information and loss of support networks, feeling of instability, loss of personal possession, language barrier, and high levels of anxiety, often regarding the family members who are left behind. Um, and, and they may also be experiencing violence at home. So these are some of the needs that um, um, women present. We, we see more of the government assisted refugees than the privately sponsored refugees because I, I'm assuming the human element offers emotional advantages uh, to that group. Now, although settlement services provide a host of much needed supports, there are some supports that are outside of settlement and women organizations like legal support and women's organizations within their capacities strive to provide holistic services that encompass the unique needs of these women through programming that target many of their needs. But I'd like to mention that an important issue to consider in this instance is that regardless of whether women arrive as government assisted refugees or privately sponsored refugees, as women's organization, an aspect of our empowerment services should focus on the promotion 
of the education and social advancement of the Afghan women and girls who have arrived in Canada, starting from where they are at right now. Um, I was so um, pleased to hear about the Afghan women resilience that Adina talked about. For years, the former Taliban government denied these Afghan women formal education. And thanks to the effort of many Afghan women activists during the succeeding governments, an enabling, an enabling environment was created for formal education of women, resulting in the emergence of qualified women leaders and professionals, who obviously have become role models for young Afghan girls. So the current situation in Afghanistan has obviously disrupted the momentous advancement of Afghan women and girls. As women's organizations here in Canada, we need to create enabling environments for these new arrivals to thrive, creating opportunities, not only for the highly educated, but also for those with lower skills and literacy levels who have seen what their peers and role models have accomplished and wish to be part of that movement. We have heard, a, we have a lot of work ahead of us, including advocacy and innovative service provision. And we must push forward to start working with the women as well as collaborating with other sectors and different levels of government to make this happen. Thank you, Mercy. Thanks very much. Over to you, Adina. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mercy. Actually, you have, uh, very well covered most of the needs. I just want to add on that. Uh, you mentioned about the mental health, the pro mental health problem. Th thank you for touching on that. Yes, but one of the um, significant barriers for the Afghan women to access the mental health services is the stigma. Especially with the, with the Afghan community, they may have internalized the stigma and don't seek support uh, for their mental disorder from organization. So that we need to identify, and that could be identified through one-on-one -on -one counseling. We can have group sessions, we can ask storytelling uh, sessions, uh, and also other other ways to approach that, which was we. So these ways, like we have, we had uh, cert, uh, certain programs for that, which was really, uh, we, we had a positive outcome. Uh, and we could achieve some some success in that, but uh, the, uh, this 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 is one of the just think the other one is the marginalization and the isolation of the women. Uh, as uh, we have uh, mentioned, some of the conservative women they may not come out, so it, it is this is also important to take them out of the isolation. Breaking the isolation for marginalized women. This is as a most important step in supporting refugee women. Uh, so this process, uh, of course, maybe set, uh, the settlement workers could uh, uh, could succeed. And but but also for to do that, we need to create a comfortable and safe environment for them. Usually, inviting women to our organization and to the facilities for the workshops and us may not have the the outcome which we did, I think it's good to go to the places which is comfortable for them. You could go to their apartments, like we started that when going to the women's apartment, talk to the, all the way the pandemic, there's, there are some barriers, but that is how it works. And also like taking them out for a cultural event, for picnic, for um, um, to other places. Sometimes you just have the kitchen to cook together. Uh, and connect them with the larger community as well. And one of the reasons, one of the uh, services which is needed, it is the parenting because the parenting uh, role is different, like it's different in Afghanistan and here. So this is also very important to talk to them and provide uh, information about the parenting, parenting in Canada while they, they know very well how to raise their children. I don't mean they don't know how to parent their children, but it is good to talk about their laws and all. Uh, this is this is other <coughs> need. Thank you. Uh, yes. Okay. Thanks, Adina. Um, I I is that okay? Is that uh, a good place to pause? Yes. Okay. I'll let you get a glass of water. Um. So um, I'll hand it over to Khalida and then um, Beba to finish off. 
Sure, yeah, I think Mercy and Adia John hit on a lot of the things. So I won't repeat kind of the stuff about, yeah, the basic needs they need. There's these short term needs. But spe speaking from like the Afghan youth or for, for young Afghan refugees that we're talking about, kind of in this frenzy of meeting their immediate needs, right? Like housing, of course, that's important and, and like food, shelter, clothing. We, we must not forget their long term needs, right? Like, you know, what happens after they find their housing? And like Adina John mentioned, like parents, uh, you know, Afghan parents, they might not know how to navigate society. They don't have that cultural capital yet of knowing who to contact for what, you know. Um, they might not know how to access resources for their young children. They might even take a more conservative approach. They might not think it's important to seek certain resources, right? And so for, for young Afghans, you know, we know that like that age is kind of a, a time where they're experiencing rapid physical, cognitive, you know, psychosocial growth. We know this. They're starting to develop their patterns of behavior. So it's the right time to try to, you know, um, kind of mold them, right? Or like molding may, might not be the best word, but provide them with the support they need so they can develop in a healthy way. And so one thing they'll need is mentorship. Right, so particularly by people who have gone through the same or similar experiences, it could be other Afghan refugees, other Afghans who are now here but who came as refugees, or it could be people of other cultures who came as refugees, like people who understand what they're going through, and they need opportunities to develop their life skills, right, like social skills, you know, navigating society skills, like how to do your taxes, you know, what is OUAC, how to apply for university or college. Um, these are things that they need like specialized help with. It's not a matter of like, we can do one presentation and that they're good. They need more support than that. Um, and and yeah, so that's, that's one thing. Safety, which um, a few people have touched on like services, you know, safety by safety, I mean like services that provide safe spaces for them, you know, love and belonging. And this goes back to being social, right? Having friends, peers, and mentors. Because we do know, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, young Afghan men um, have the tendency at times to, you know, get involved with, you know, um, negative social behavior, right? Like joining gangs or engaging in substance use. And these things happen when, when they don't get the help that they need or the support that they need. And so we want to prevent things from going there. Um, and I just want to touch on parenting. That's so important. You know, it's difficult for Afghan youth sometimes because like our parents mostly had to focus on like their physiological and safety needs. They didn't have the opportunity to kind of self-actualize, right? And um, this often becomes a point of contention and tension between Afghan parents and young Afghans who are trying to balance like their identities and their desires. And so that's an important context to keep in mind about kind of what parents might be thinking versus what the youth kind of want to do. Um, and then mental health support, we've talked about it, but um, in my opinion, every single Afghan youth or not should be screened for PTSD. Um, I don't know how that happens in the settlement context, but um, I would even go as far to say that we should assume they have PTSD, but either way, they need access to mental health counseling and psychiatrists and psychologists, whoever it is that they can connect with and who can take a culturally competent approach to the trauma that they've all experienced. Thank you so much. Very important points raised there, especially about um, the ongoing needs that they're long term. And I think, Beba, that's where you're going to also focus in on more sort of integration over the long term over um, over time for for families. You are still on mute. I have heard everybody mention parenting, so I'll say a few words about that. Every single family that arrived to Calgary had access to SIVA's cross-cultural parenting services that we offered um, individually to families in the hotels. And as of last, we started group parenting sessions with first language support. Parenting programs are one of the specialty of SIVA and started over 30 years ago. So we have um, uh, customized parenting programs for parents, for fathers, and even for grandparents. The fact that we have, through our one of our bridging programs, graduates and um, certifies interpreter, um, community interpreters and, and translators, we provide actually parenting um, training with the first language support. Um, I also wanted to say a few things about mental health that we have uh, identified as um, an issue quite a bit of anxiety. Um, a few women that we saw lost their children. 
Um, and um, we have Center for Resilience in Calgary, and that center is working with them. Also, agencies, including CIVA, have case management, um, uh, clinical services in relation to traumas that clients um, went through, but also overall family conflict or any kind of trauma that um, families and individuals might have gone through. Philosophically speaking, when we, when we talk about gender services, um, the, uh, there are many settlement agencies, not all of them, all agencies serve women, not just women's organizations. The most vulnerable um, newcomer women with multiple barriers, literacy, language, um, skill issues, um, inability, uh, maybe a lack of experience or any kind of training from their home country, they typically benefit uh, better from gender-specific um, services in women's programs because that's the focus of our work. However, we have 17 bridging programs. Some of them are for the low to mid-literacy immigrant women and others are for the highly professional immigrant women. Regardless of the level of skills, Typically, women's organizations will provide more, more support for all women for the gender-specific supports, like access to childcare, access to mentoring, access to all things that are, it's all about wrapping around services and making sure that women have uh, services that are equitable, meaning uniquely uh, adjusted to their needs fairly, really synonym for equity is fairness. So that is one thing that we are trying to promote in terms of the Alberta response to um, serving Afghani women. And we have already started um, initiative through ASA to connect with all women's agencies in Alberta. SIVA is the biggest agency for gender specific um, services for immigrants in Canada has 60 plus different programs that relate from, that go all the way from literal foundational and employment literacy that then has full path and customized programs to employment after limited literacy. Counseling, case management, legal supports, employment support for young mothers that are very different from employment supports for some other mothers, maybe mothers with older children or mothers with adult children. So um, I would like to point out how absolutely essential it is that women's organizations connect and exchange best, in the exchange best practices that all of us might have produced and could share with others. There are some things that SIVA can, many things that SIVA, SIVA can share with other agencies as a ready to go um, outcome measurement framework, ready models for all programs, very particularly for literacy programs. But there are also other programs that we would love to receive from other agencies that they have done well and we, and we might not have been as successful. So that actually over the next few years, uh, women from Afghanistan have equitable access wherever they live in Canada. And I really think that the onus should be on the agencies to connect and see what is it, how can we stretch the impact? How can, first, how can we stretch the outcomes for our clients, but then the impact of the 40,000 Afghani refugees that are coming over the next few years and how that might benefit not just those who we are inviting to come to Canada, but also the communities that they live in. So I think that's a very important thing. Um, as for the, uh, I also want to talk very briefly about the importance of translation and interpretation and the ability to produce, to provide uh, uh, families with the culturally sensitive and language specific supports. What we, because of this program that CIVA has for the um, training and certification of, um, of uh, interpreters and translators, and by the way, Mercy, we do that with um, CISOC in Ottawa. That's who we work in partnership to, to um, certify our clients. We were able to send seven staff uh, to CCIS to work immediately with resettlement services so that there is no, uh, there is no gaps in the communication between Afghani refugees and agencies. But absolutely very important collaboration. 
Thank you so much, Beva. Thank you for those remarks. And now um, we will, I hope, have a little bit of time for questions from the audience. We have several that are waiting for your attention. So maybe with that in mind on these last questions, um, if it would be um, helpful to focus on what hasn't already been said, that would be wonderful. Um, so it's about how we would have not only gender responses, but also trauma-informed approaches to offering services uh, for Afghan women and their families as they are in Canada. What do you think uh, service providers need to know and how do they need to act and what should they be considering? Um, so maybe uh, first off, I'll start with um, um, Halida. De Halida, why don't you go first? Sure, yeah, I'll be brief, although I do feel like I can speak from the youth perspective. I do think that some of the others will have definitely more, more to say. Um, the first thing is understanding that a lot of, just again, from the youth perspective, uh, will have intergenerational trauma, what we, what we call. So obviously, as everyone knows, the phenomena, like the parents passing down the trauma to their children, and then the children having their own trauma, of course. And every single Afghan you'll ever meet, refugee or not, definitely has experienced some form of this. Um, and so recognizing while, you know, the youth are certainly grateful to be here, they are struggling with this, this trauma of the memories left behind. Um, and unfortunately, like Adina John mentioned earlier, there is a lot of mental, like stigma around mental health. You know, it's often viewed as like, you know, uh, if you have a mental health issue, it's viewed as like you being crazy sometimes, you know, not every Afghan, but a lot of Afghans. And so, you know, those conversations might take a while, right? Depending on who you're talking to. And so just being mindful of that, not being judgmental, but understanding that's just kind of how the, the culture is and where, where they're coming from. Um, I also mentioned, you know, young Afghans will find themselves struggling to reconcile kind of who they were in Afghanistan and then the new norms and lifestyle of young people here, you know, there's more freedom, you know, and all of that. So young Afghans often develop dual identities kind of, and this is a reality that a lot of Afghan parents have a hard time accepting. And so ensuring that young Afghans are, you know, connected with the stable social support system, acknowledging to them that, you know, this reality, I think will, can help them a lot. And we saw this in our Afghan youth mentorship program that we ran, where we worked with young Afghan refugees and connected them with Afghan mentors in Canada. Um, they, we had great conversations around identity and all these things. And um, it just, it helps at the end of the day to, to help them integrate more into society if they're more comfortable and feel more like they belong. Um, and then empowering women and girls, like I think we'll we've talked so much about that. Um, so I, I don't think I, I can add anything more that's been said to that. Um, you know, it's just a real one reality of cultures might be that sometimes young Afghan women are encouraged to get married kind of like younger, you know, sooner the better. It's just kind of a thing that happens in our culture. Um, there's no coercion, but there is a pressure. And so try to empower young girls and women from an early age to identify their interests and passions in school and in life and encouraging them to pursue that would be very helpful. And then lastly, quickly, I'll just say, um, you know, young Afghan males need a different kind of support. They experience different kinds of trauma. Um, you know, Afghan fathers sometimes aren't as present as the mothers. Um, and so there, you know, identify risk factors, you know, for, for young Afghan men who, who might be more at risk of getting involved in those negative social behaviors I mentioned before. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Um, and maybe with that, I'll pass it over to Beba and then we'll go to Mercy and Adina. And uh, we do have several questions in the Q&A. So if you could, maybe I'll keep your remarks to two or three minutes so that we have time for questions, if that's okay. Sorry, I was reading through the chat. So what was the question? <laughs> the question is, um, what was it? what is it that service providers need to know about providing um, not only gender responsive, but also trauma informed approaches to um, addressing the, the needs of uh, Afghan families and uh, women and their families? Yeah. So. I would say that mercifully, um, we might have achieved a decent level of capacity within the settlement sector and agencies that have um, gender specific mandates to actually provide clinical services and to be ready for any new influx of refugees 
with the steady regularly funded programs and services. SIVA is one of those agencies. We have uh, funding for the um, clinical services. We have, uh, we are um, um, refugee, um, in, in, in Alberta, we have um, family resource networks and SIVA is a family resource network, not just for women, for the immigrant families in Calgary with clinical services funded by children's services. I mentioned to you that we have um, um, very comprehensive uh, parenting supports, case management supports, and uh, trauma-informed supports. I also mentioned the um, Center for Resiliency that works with Alberta Health Services. And there is a refugee clinic in uh, Calgary that we uh, collect all the agencies work uh, together with them. And actually SIVA has had funding to produce uh, gender specific um, um, videos um, uh, for immigrant women in multiple languages to access health services and to describe in first languages what health services mean, should mean to immigrant women and why they should avail of them. So um, the fact that IOCC has identified women as one of the five priorities for the funding period 2025 speaks about the, I should say, the good work that everybody in the settlement sector has done to finally acknowledge that gender specific services are absolutely crucial for the successful settlement integration of newcomers to Canada. Forget about women, everybody, expect, and, and supporting women means having successful children. Uh, what I think uh, is crucial is uh, building the capacity, equitable capacity within agencies that serve women and providing uh, um, all big and small centers that actually host refugees and refugee women with resources that can provide the same level of service that they need, whether they're in the rural community or in Toronto or in Calgary. So that is a policy issue that, she, that we should be advocate, advocating towards so that we can achieve the goals that the government wants, which is to have as many refugees distributed in, um, in Canada so that the labor market um, benefits from them, but also support them equitably. So I think that again, on that point, there are many good examples of collaboration and exchange of um, program models and service models that we can avail of and um, make sure that Afghani women have access to them. That's great. Thank you so much. That is fantastic. So over um, Mercy, if there's something um, that you would like to add um, or expand on further, um, over to you. Yes, I, I would like to uh, just echo what Beba has just said and, and restate that gender specific services are actually crucial. And in the in the context of gender based violence, if I may touch on that. So gender-based violence exists in our communities, is that it exists in the newcomer communities. And you know, we have a lot of women who come to, to Canada who don't know their rights. So they they live in situations of violence without knowing. So it's critical that we have safe spaces, women's only spaces, where they can receive the needed supports that um, um, that are available to them. They may have entered Canada with an abusive partner and want to separate from him. How do how do, how does she do that in a safe way without re fear of reprisals? Um, what are her legal rights? What are her human rights? What are the can Canadian laws around gender-based violence? These safe places must exist for these women to receive this critical um, services and supports and also examine the implications for the woman who is being abused uh, in terms of housing supports and financial supports. I think it's important for um, service providers working with um, women who are experiencing gender violence, gender-based violence, to understand intersectionality and the different intersecting oppressions that women face and, and this helps service providers to adequate, adequately provide services. I'd like to also touch very briefly, because we're rushing through 
on the importance of using interpretation service as needed. And this is critical, and I cannot stress it enough, because the lack of adequate English or French language skills is a huge barrier for women to disclose violence and seek support. So interpretation services provided by professionally trained interpreters who have additional training in, in terminology, for instance, on sexual assault, domestic violence, and human trafficking, it, they are available across the province of Ontario and they are free of charge for service providers working with survivors of violence. So it's so important that interpretation not be minimalized. Uh, providers of language interpretation service are currently, as we speak, training more interpreters who speak Dari and Pashto to meet the demand uh, as we receive more refugees from Afghanistan. And as we anticipate, uh, as we experienced when we had the Syrians coming in and as we've experienced with the, the pandemic, the increase, the uh, unproportional increase of violence against women. So we're trying to be proactive and preparing for that need. I would also like to add that we need to do more work in terms of prevention of gender-based violence. As we receive new residents into our communities, we need to focus on prevention. It is important that we bring information on prevention of gender-based violence to the new arrivals and involve both the men and the women in the conversation. And it's important that service providers working with these women across sectors receive training on how to recognize the signs of abuse, how to respond, and have available resources where they can make appropriate referrals as it concerns gender-based violence. So I had Thank a lot you. more to say, but in the interest of time, I will just leave it there. Thank you, Mercy. And I appreciate that uh, you're all very, very well um, versed in so many subjects and have so much to offer. And of course, this is just a slice of what we're able to share on uh, at, at this particular time. So I very much appreciate um, that you're, you're um, bearing with us as we go through it in this way. I do also really echo, Mercy, the gender-based violence perspective is especially important in light of um, trauma too. We know that trauma is often, and crisis displacement is, is also the kind of pressure, uh, the pandemic, of course, they are the kinds of pressures that increase the risks of gender-based violence. So it's critical that we mention that in this context. So um, over to you, Adina, to, to add a few more comments, and then Karen will open up the Q&A. Okay, thank you. I'll be very brief. First of all, I echo everybody. When you were speaking, I thought you were reading my mind, actually. You have already covered most of the stuff I was going to say. But just uh, something we have to keep in mind, when we're talking about the refugee and the trauma that refugees are going uh, through, we have to remember this group of refugees who are coming, they are different uh, from the other refugee groups because they, something happened suddenly in their li lives. It was so rushed. They are coming in a very chaotic manner when they leave their, uh, uh, their country. They left their family members, their houses, their belongings, belongs, and some of them came with only one pair of clothing, nothing else. And you have seen on TV that, that chaotic uh, uh, that situation in the airport, how they came. I know I was talking with one of the newcomers. She said that they were, when their vehicle was going, like they were, they were going through the bullets, their they, they bullets fired on them by the Taliban. So this is something we have to keep in mind. And also we have to, we, we remember that talking about trauma impact the, on refugees, the women are more exposed to the trauma because despite all, they are also the, the response, uh, responsible and bearing the responsibility to protect their family members, all family members. So uh, you're talking about the capacity uh, the, for your settlement organizations. It's important to, to train all the staff members on the trauma uh, uh, the trauma that they are going in the, the initial, initial training for all the workers. It's important, especially when uh, we are talking about the violence, about the about women and all, and also to keep in mind that these women have got through such a violent situation so in their lives. 
So we should acknowledge that might be uh, affecting their behaviors. So that is something that uh, we, we won't keep just uh, rush on blaming them that we don't acknowledge that. For the staff also, it is important when the staff are working with the traumatized women, this is also support for the staff is also very important. We should not burn out our staff because I know how it impacts them. So there should be support also available for the staff. I'll, close, I'll stop here. And thank you. I think that was an excellent point to end on. Adina, we've heard a lot recently about the um, the not uh, burnout due to to the pandemic, and um, of course we've we've been met, over the years heard a lot about vicarious trauma related to staffing um, and uh, compassion fatigue. And so it's extremely important that you raise that. Thank you for finishing on that note. So Karen has a few questions for us. Um, she has tried to, I think, group the multiple questions in the chat box into themes, and she'll be taking us through this next section. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Anu. And hi, everybody. Thanks so much for your comments and to all of the participants for your fantastic questions. I've been trying to read through them and I'll do my best to get to as many as, uh, as we can. Um, the first piece, I think maybe we can pick up on what Adina was, was just speaking about, um, about what's happening in Afghanistan and the journey to get to Canada. There seems to be a lot of interest in this, um, in the uh, in the chat box right now, um, the the question I guess is how difficult is it for women and their families to leave Afghanistan right now? Um, what does that process look like, um, and who is getting left behind in in the process? Um, so I guess maybe maybe Adina, would you like to pick that up first? Yeah, no, leaving your country. Okay. Leaving your country, your community, your friends is really difficult for anybody, for any for, for women, for men, for everybody. But who most they have left behind their friends, they have left behind their family members. I know one of the refugees who came here you know, all the day she was worried because she left her elderly mother. She was the only caregiver for that mother who would fall under, under the de facto family member, but she couldn't bring the, her and now she cannot bring it. So she's looking for private sponsored refugees. Uh, of course, belonging, like the other refugees said that they made their, they, they worked so hard for 20 years to make it, to, to buy a small house and have all the households. They, they couldn't take anything behind with them. So they, they, that it is extremely difficult, even for legal uh, migration. It's not easy to like, like go from one country to the other country. Like I can say, for, I mean, I, like I was in India when I became a refugee. For me, when I first became a refugee, I applied for refugee status. I felt I had lost everything. I thought I had lost my culture, my family, my the, even my dignity. And I was really ashamed of being called refugees because at that time, of course, my perception of refugee was far from reality. Like I, so this, and also just, just the, 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 just entering a country as a refugee, somebody who's like in need or something. This is also like uh, affecting them. And I know that women are so resilient. The, 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 these are not, so the, 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 this is, and also leaving uh, behind, some of these refugees also left, left their family members are, are behind, but we are talking who is left behind. There are so many vulnerable women, abused women who are left behind in Afghanistan and there is no uh, much available. IRCC has just uh, announced their plan last week and why I look with for this for the fund support uh, criteria, there, there is also further limitation or regular criteria for, for the Afghans. Like there are, there are certain categories they have established, it's very difficult to meet those categories. So that, that leaves behind Afghan, uh, the, the uh, abused women. And one of the things that most of the, uh, we, we forget is like when Taliban went to Afghanistan, they, released all the prisoners from the jails. And some of the prisoners were the, offend, the uh, offenders and they, were, they had abused their wives and brutally. 
Now I know some, some woman, I get called from Afghanistan. She says, my husband is released. There's no protection for me. I'm hiding. I'll be killed what to do. So these are, these are these, some many, many, many vulnerable Afghans are left behind with this program and the, also mm, the limitation for us as a, as a sponsorship holders to be able to bring them to Canada because, the, because of the limitation of the uh, spaces for the allocation and also because of the new criteria that they are imposing on these new cases. Thanks very much, Adina. Um, Khalida, it looked like you were going to try to say something. Would you like to jump in on this question as well? No, I think, sorry, I wasn't, uh, I was probably just kind of reacting to what Adina John was saying, but no, I, I for the sake of time, I'll say I, I agree with everything that, that she definitely said. Okay, Mercy, Beba, did you want to weigh in on this question as well? I think Adina has, has said it all um, in the interest of time. Yes, I think she said it all, yeah. Okay, great. Great. Um, and Beba, maybe a, a question for you, given your uh, connection to the resettlement efforts that are, are being arranged through Calgary, um, can you um, help to clarify within the Canadian government resettlement program, what do those criteria look like? Who are the, the, the folks who are included in Canada's um, attempt to, to bring people out? Well, obviously, we have heard that uh, people that have worked with the government, with the USA and Canadian government for the humanitarian initiatives in Afghanistan have um, been prioritized. And obviously, uh, some of the speakers have mentioned that they have already arrived, and, and some of them have arrived to Calgary, too. Um, I think I mentioned previously that there is the agreement between Canadian and um, USA government uh, for some of the refugees that have been um, evacuated by Americans and are currently waiting in safe havens uh, for the paperwork and the administrative work between USA and Canada to be done so that they can be sent to Canada. Um, as far as we also mentioned that uh, the issue of, per, of the government sponsored refugees and privately sponsored refugees is actually at the heat of the negotiations and decision making with the government in terms of, 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 of what the ratio should be and why. And um, that also affects the um, resources of the federal government, obviously, because at least in the first year, there is, uh, there is uh, much less commitment by, uh, by the government in terms of the basic needs for the privately sponsored refugees, even though they're eligible for all the services offered through the agencies, except for shelter and food and whatnot. So I think it's uh, uh, last week, uh, there was an update, national update by the Arab Hub and the IRCC. And there wasn't really much more that they said from what you heard from me today. Obviously, you know, the government wants to be sure that the decision is made and then they share that decision with everybody in a transparent way. But I don't think that, um, uh, I mentioned that between now and the end of fiscal year, there should be 11,000 uh, Afghanis arriving. I'm quite sure that those have been already decided upon in terms of the prioritizing some of them based on their nature of their issues or the availability or the easiness of arranging for the transport to Canada. Uh, much of the work that we are engaged in is still from the government all through RAP hubs and settlement is still in the process of planning, really. I hope I answered your question as much as I could. You did great. Thank you, Beba. Um, so an, uh, another question sort of following on from that, um, there's a number of people in the chat who are asking about how they can find out how many uh, Afghan families uh, are coming to their regions or to their communities and how they can link up with organizations that would be supporting them. Um, have there been communications uh, from IRCC about 
how people are going to be moving if they come to say a hub in Toronto and then where they will move to from there? Um, how, how can people find out that information about who they can expect to show up in their region? And I, I can see Adina has uh, taken herself off mute. So please go ahead, Adina. <laughs> Yeah, um, for me, it's difficult to have the exact number, but I know some of the, a, a large number of refugees would initially distinct to other provinces. They were, they were, uh, they were landed in Toronto, but they don't want to go. They want to stay here, they prefer. And also there are some secondary migration, like I, people are other provinces staying in there. I don't know why they are attracted to come to Toronto, but IRCC had decided to land a, a number of refugees out of uh, Toronto and other provinces that happened, but we got some calls even from them, how they could get back to Toronto. So it's, it's very difficult for uh, for us to give the number and the IRCC has not given, I, I, at least I'm not aware of the breakdown of the provinces. Just wanted to mention that. If I may add uh, to that, I think uh, co communication is not as forthcoming as uh, we would want it to be. Uh, but I just wanted to also mention that you know there is um, the the um, the Afghan Resettlement National Steering Committee. Um, so that's working with um, IRCC. And OCASI does have two designates on that um, um, uh, uh, National Steering Committee. So uh, some information is sifting through from, from that end. Okay, great. And but I think uh, the better bet would be, you know, contacting the RAP agencies in the various um, regions um, for, for more information about the numbers. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, maybe time for one final quick question. And this one is uh, about programming and, um, you know, how we create uh, programs and spaces for, for Afghan women and youth. Um, what considerations should service providers be mindful of when they're creating, in particular, training opportunities or programs uh, for participants who uh, might ha uh, be coming with, with refugee status and, and trauma? Some of this has been addressed already, but if there's anything in particular that you'd like people to take away, that would be helpful to know. And maybe I'll start with Khalida. Sure, yeah, I think uh, I think it was Mercy earlier spoke really well about this and, and trauma-informed trauma approaches. Uh, you know, again, speaking from the youth perspective, I think it just starts with awareness of kind of the context that they're in. Uh, but, you know, during any training or education, uh, delivery of educational resources, um, being mindful of that context and providing resources that are, I think, like culturally competent and understand like what, what they're kind of going through. Um, and knowing that, you know, you might not see like, the, you know, youth might not be responsive right away, but continuing to try to build that relationship with them over time is really important. Uh, so they can build trust, they can open up, they feel safe, and they're more likely then to access those resources. So that's really important. And I think also equipping like young, like women and, you know, like younger women or like women who are mothers as well um, with resources for them, like th that can empower them, like legal resources, community resources, places for them to hang out with each other. Like that is a form of healing. You know, I like I think my mom back in the day like went to like it was like a sewing, you know, little workshop or something, but like she got to hang out with other Afghan moms like they're all in the same situation. It was like so good for her in terms of healing from that trauma. So, uh, you know, things like that end up do end up making a big difference. Thank you, Khalida. Anyone else with a final thought, Adina? I think one of the other what Ms. Khaldajan touched on is the youth and parents issue that they're, 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 the, most of the family, when they come here, there is a gap between the gender, intergeneration gap. And because the youth are living in, different, in two different cultures, the culture in the school and the culture at home. So this is very important to provide services and information to the parents about the school system and get them involved in their, in their children's education. The, 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 this the, uh, and also like maybe have them 
take them to the school meetings uh, with, the, with the teachers and all this this is this is one of the important and uh, trying to avoid the creation of gap between the youth and uh, with the parents uh, that will be by more education and how the general do that better because she's uh, working with youth and also for the youth because some of the youth when they come here when they get into the they go to school there are some social social problems within the Canadian society but the youth sometimes they try to identify themselves with the western culture so they think that's the most that, that would be a part of the culture they want to start following that just for working with the youth to be proud of who they are with their own culture and also learn living in a multi in a culture multicultural society accept others adopt the good the, the positive uh, cultural aspects of the other cultures and also uh, educate others on who you are uh, uh, i mean and, and they should know that they are contributing to the, the to enrich the diversity in this country for their self-esteem they shouldn't be ashamed of who they are i wanted to quickly add i'm so sorry just real quick two things one is you know don't be afraid to reach out to like Afghan groups themselves, like if you're developing a training material and you don't know, like, yeah. you know, there's not a lot of established Afghan groups, like we are a relatively new population in Canada, Afghan Women's Organization is a great one, they are very established, but reach out, you know, a lot of groups like we're here to help. Um, and, you know, like, so feel free to do that. The, the second thing is, I think Mercy mentioned, like, understanding the intersectionality. So there are groups within Afghans who have been more oppressed than others, women and girls is one, but certainly like the Hazara, ethnic group, they've, you know, experienced uh, kind of genocide, right? So, you know, there's nuances sometimes and it's important to, to acknowledge that at least, because um, again, there's that intersectional approach. And very briefly, everything's been said, but when organizing training, I think it's important that support services are attached to those trainings, especially childcare, child minding to enable these women to participate in the training. So support services are also critical and we should consider those as well. Thank you for that important reminder, Mercy. And in fact, um, that does close the panel for today. And I want to take this opportunity before we go much further to really thank you, Adina, Beba, Mercy and uh, Halida for all of your support. Thank you to the um, tech support, um, all of our uh, Canadian Women's Foundation support um, behind the scenes. Thank you to our interpreters. Thank you to everyone who organized. Thank you, Debbie, for opening the session so well and starting us off um, on this uh, with uh, by centering uh, truth and reconciliation. Um, and I think, I hope that all of you, as you, as you leave, you do take away what uh, Debbie mentioned at the beginning, so what supports are Afghan families, Afghani families and um, women likely to need, how can settlement agencies and um, uh, service providers center their rights, agency and self-determination. And of course, while we focus today on the particularities of what's happening in Afghanistan and that particular refugee crisis, we know that Canada is a country with so many refugees, immigrants, those who have been displaced, migrant um, people, and it, these concerns affect all of them too in different ways. So that's another perhaps intersectional message to finish with um, to just remind us and thank you all for the incredibly important work you're doing. Thank you so much. <laughs>